Okay, the next topic, this topic that we're going to cover now is sort of the last thing that we're going to look at before the test, and it's probably the most difficult thing. <clears throat> now, in, in a traditional AP Physics C class, I'll just, I'll just, and we'll talk about this in class, usually the first thing people cover is kinematics without rotation, and then they jump into force, and then they do energy. And then they do momentum. And then they finally do rotation. And then they do gravity. <clears throat> I don't necessarily like that idea, especially because rotation is new. And most of kinematics, most of force, most of energy, and most of momentum is stuff that we talked about last year in pre-AP. <clears throat> now, the topic that we're about to cover, um, I'm right up here. Moment of inertia. This topic takes a little bit of getting used to. And I don't think that a three-week unit right towards the end of the semester is near enough time to let this idea of the moment of inertia sneak in. So what I've done is taken ro rotation, and I've changed some stuff up here, I've taken rotation and sprinkled it in to each of these units. And so that's why we talked about um, those rotational quantities before, and that's why we're talking about moment of inertia now. So as we get into this, let's again look at our oof, our linear motion stuff and our rotational stuff. When we talked about position, we used x for it. Well, in rotational motion, we talk about angle. And we use theta for it. <clears throat> and going between those two, we have our formula that says um, x equals r theta. The next thing that we had was velocity. Pardon the occasional malfunction from the pen here. We have velocity. We used a V for that. And here we have um, angular velocity. And we used an omega. And again, velocity is going to be our Omega. <clears throat> Last thing we have is acceleration. And of course that's an A. And here we have angular acceleration. They are not clever names when it comes down to it. And we have alpha. And we have A equals R alpha. And so all these quantities, these are fairly simple to deal with. Now, the next quantity that we usually talk about when we talk about linear stuff, regardless of what we're going to do, is inertia. Now, as we recall from last year, or we should, inertia is the tendency of an object to keep on doing what it's doing. Okay, Inertia is, as when I said, a property of matter, um, and the way that we measure inertia is mass m so when we talk about mass in physics um, we're talking about inertia this property that objects have or, or a measure of an object's resistance to a change in motion when it comes down to it, I would rather you throw a ping pong ball at my face uh, than, than a pool ball at my face because it has less mass. My face doesn't have to put up that much resistance to stop a ping pong ball. Okay. Now, over here in rotation land, when we talk about that resistance to a change in motion, it's a resistance to a change in angular or rotational motion. It's when an object spins. So 
it's going to be resistance to a change in spin or a change in angular motion resistance to a change in our angular velocity more or less and we don't call it inertia anymore it is the moment of inertia and for moment of inertia we use an I so <clears throat> One last thing before we change it over. When we talk about inertia, really the thing that quantifies this whole resistance to a change in motion is Newton's second law. Force equals mass. Oh, nope, did the wrong thing. Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. And this mass told me how hard it was to make my object accelerate. Well, we get the same thing over here, but it's not force anymore. It's something called torque, which we will get to. It's the equivalent of, of force. And that's equal to moment of inertia times angular acceleration. And so when we talk about moment of inertia over here, it looks just like mass. It behaves the same way, but it's the resistance to an object's change in spinning. Uh, the more moment of inertia I have, the harder it is to speed up the spin, the harder it is to make the thing spin. So we're going to get into calculating that just a little bit. <clears throat> so moment of inertia, at its simplest definition for a single object that's moving at a radius r away from something is uh, the mass of that object times how far away it is from the radius squared. So if that's my pivot point, If that's my pivot point, then I have my mass here, a distance of r away. In order to make that mass spin, okay, I have to fight against this mr squared thing. Now what this is saying is if I double this, if I make that radius twice as long, if I make that radius twice as long, I'm going to have actually four times as much moment of inertia to deal with. And this is our simplest case. This would be the moment for a point mass. Easiest thing that we're going to have to deal with. Now, uh, the next thing that we would deal with, if the drawing works with us today, is a ring. Now, <clears throat> with the ring, we got radius r and mass m spread all the way around the end. Well, that's just like a point mass spread out all the way through the thing. So for a ring, the moment of inertia for a ring, and we'll play with all these things in class tomorrow so that we can see it. We're just getting started here. The moment of inertia for a ring is the same thing, mr squared because all of the mass is the same distance away from the center. <clears throat> the next thing that we have is a solid disk. But again, it has radius r. Disk. For our disk, the moment of inertia, I for disk, everything's spread out more of that mass is closer in towards the center. So for a disk, we have one half mr squared. It has less rotational inertia. So it's easier to spin a disk than it is a ring. This is why when you look at certain bicycle wheels, they have that solid disk in the back. It's easier to spin that than it is a ring of the same mass. In fact, it's about half as much easier to spin the thing. The next thing that we have, I can't draw so well right here. So you can pretend that that's an awesome drawing of a sphere. 
So with the sphere, you're taking a disc and you're spinning it. But again, we have the same amount of mass. It has the same radius r all the way across. And I apologize for the horrible drawing of a sphere. But because of this mass distribution, the moment of inertia for a sphere is 2 fifths mr squared. You need to memorize these for a point mass, for a ring, for a disc, and for a sphere. These things need to be ingrained into your memory. This is the kind of thing that comes up on the multiple choice test when you don't have a formula sheet anymore. These are the things that you kind of need to know cold. We have two more, so bear with me. And these are things that you can experiment with at your house. So imagine that that is, well, and it's going to take a lot of imagining. It's a rod, and we're going to rotate this rod about its center. That's my pivot point. Now, <clears throat> if we rotate this rod about its center, about its center mass, it comes out to be 1 12th m times the length of the rod. I'm just going to say L squared. Mass of the rod times the length of the rod squared. Now, if we take that same rod and spin it about its end, if that's our pivot, it's going to have a different moment of inertia. I've changed the mass distribution about that pivot. So the moment of inertia for rod about its end that's a horrible way to abbreviate that, don't worry. Moment of inertia for a rod about its end is one-third mass times the length squared. Now you can do this with a baseball bat. If you hold a baseball bat right at the end and just try to move it around, it's kind of difficult. If you take that same baseball bat or softball bat or meter stick, I have a lot of meter sticks at the house, not so many baseball bats, so grab the meter stick by its center and spin it, it's a lot easier than it is to spin it when the meter stick is down and it's in. It has less resistance to that change in spin. So that's something that you can look at. Now, the relationship between these two is the next thing that we're going to talk about. It's called the parallel, parallel. axis theorem. Now, for the parallel axis theorem, what we're going to do is take something like the rod that has a known moment of inertia about its center of mass, and we're going to spin it about another point that is not the center of mass. In this case, it's going to be the end. So, that's our new pivot point. So this whole length is L, and this length is L over 2. Now, parallel axis theorem says when we make it spin about this point, we're going to see two different things. The first thing that we're going to see when we rotate the object about that point is we're actually going to see that thing spinning about its center of mass. Take your pencil as you're taking notes. And as you rotate it about the tip, if you were to look at the center of mass, you would see it rotating back and forth right there. So for our total moment of inertia, we're going to have to deal with this 1 12th ml squared part. That's still there. But something else is happening as we rotate about this pivot. When we rotate about this pivot, what we have is the center of mass acting like a point mass of mass m spinning about our new pivot point <clears throat> as if it were just a mass spinning about that pivot point. Now this length is L over 2. So the moment of inertia of what's going on here is m 
times L over 2 squared. So in order to see what's happening with the whole motion, I have to add these two pieces together. So it's going to be 1 12th ml squared plus m times l squared over 4. <clears throat> so if we uh, do common denominator stuff, l squared over 4 is the same as saying 3l squared over 12. So I'm going to get 4 twelfths ml squared or 1 third ml squared which is what we expect for that. Now the parallel axis theorem works for anything that we spin around an axis that's not its center of mass. So our general form for that I about a new axis we'll call it located h away is going to be I about the center of mass plus the moment of inertia of the center of mass times the distance we are from the center of mass squared. That's exactly what we did here. We will look at multiple examples of this before I quiz you more, test you more. Okay. In the example that we did up here, this distance was h. That's what we plugged in right there. This is my ICM and this over here is M H squared again this distance is H how far away my new pivot is from the center of mass that's it for the parallel axis theorem 